if the boys wanted Rosanna or Walter, they had to go through the front room and call, cr and call up the stairs. But Frank was eight by the time it was finished, and they moved in and hadn't <coughs> John and Gus been sleeping downstairs on the back sleeping porch off the kitchen of Rosanna's parents' house since Gus was five and John was seven. Walter put two windows in the south side of the addition and a window on the west side, but no window into the north side. He also studded out a future opening so that one day he could install a door, but just the thought of Frankie with a door to call his own made him nervous. He had not spared the rod and he had not therefore spoiled the child, but Frankie was the most determined child he had ever seen, far, far surpassing himself, Howard, Rolf, and everyone else on Rosanna's side of the family. It was as if when he saw certain things, his brain simply latched onto them and would not let them go. It wasn't even contrariness. Half the time Walter could say, Frankie, don't do that. And Frankie wouldn't do whatever it was because he didn't care about it. The other half of the time, it didn't matter what Walter said or even what Frankie said. There was a bucket of three and a half inch nails. Walter said, Frankie, leave the nails alone. Okay, Papa. I mean it. Yes, Papa. An hour later, the bucket of nails was turned over and Frankie was sifting through them. Frankie, I told you not to touch the nails. I wanted to find something. What? A longer nail. I told you not to touch the nails, but I wanted to find it. I forbade you, but I wanted to find it. Did you find it? No. Now I have to give you a whipping. And then he took off his belt and grasped the buckle and holding Frankie by the upper arm, had him take down his pants. What did I tell you? Whack. <coughs> not to touch the nails. Whack. If I tell you not to touch the nails, you are not to touch the nails. Whack. I wanted to find it. Whack. What do I do if I tell you not to touch the nails and you touch the nails? Whack. Whip me. Whack. Why did you touch the nails? Whack. I wanted to find it. Whack. Are you going to do that again if I tell you not to? Whack. No, Papa. Whack. But of course he did. Nails, after all, were not the same as crawling under the front porch or climbing to the very top of the tree or standing on the roof of the house or dropping from the hayloft where he was not supposed to be in the first place onto Jake's back. What would happen if they got electricity? That was the rumor lately, especially since they were so close to town. It was expensive, but worth it, everyone said. <clears throat> For Frankie, the wires would be a constant temptation just to try this with a screwdriver or that with a fork. It seemed as though Frankie had to be taught every single lesson in every variation. And yes, Miss Jenkins over at the school said that Frankie was the smartest child she'd ever seen in her life and was on to division, not to mention training for the spelling bee at the end of the school year. And I do not know who was going to give him any competition Certainly, he went to school willingly and even enthusiastically every morning, so that was something to be thankful for. <sighs> Walter did not know what to make of his two boys. If you looked at it in a certain way, then the one who needed the beatings to toughen him up, namely Joey, never did a thing to earn a beating because he hadn't the gumption, and the one who got the beatings learned nothing from them. <laughs> Looking back on his own childhood, Walter saw a much more orderly system. His father and mother told them the rules. If they got out of line, not even intending to, they got a whipping to help them remember the next time. And they did remember the next time, and so they got fewer beatings, and so they became boys who could get the work done. Since there was plenty of it, it had to get done. That was life, as far as Walter was concerned. You surveyed the landscape and took note of what was needed, and then you did it. And the completed tasks <coughs> piled up behind you like a kind of treasure or at least evidence of virtue. What life was for Frankie, he could not imagine. So the, the child Lillian is uh, 17 months old in this one. And <clears throat> she, they're building the room so that she can have a room of her own. And so I'm going to read a little bit about Lillian. 
and this takes place in 1930, so in the summer, a uh, year and a half later. The moment when Rosanna knew she'd been living in a fool's paradise was the moment she pumped the second basin of water. She'd already undressed Lillian and set her into the first tub of water to cool off. It would certainly be a hundred out there at least, and Lillian was paddling mildly and dipping a couple of spoons in and out of her bath. She was half talking to Rosanna. As she said, Lolly and Lizzie need a nap, and Rosanna answered automatically, I'm sure they do, they were up late last night. The water that spurted out of the tap over the sink fell brown and thick into the pail and then stopped. Rosanna had never seen a well go dry before. She set the pail down into the sink and put her hands on her hips. Her hands were trembling. The farm had three wells, one beside the barn, this one by the house, and an old one that had been capped some years ago, not far from the chicken house. Rosanna had no idea how deep this well was or how it compared with the others. Sometimes that didn't matter. Water could be deep or shallow. She glanced over at Lillian. The tub the girl was sitting in was not at all large. It had a flat bottom and flared sides about 12 inches high, and Lillian was sitting with her legs crossed. The water, which was clear, came up about six inches in the hot weather. Rosanna had been letting her sit in the water every afternoon just to stave off any fevers or heat strokes that might be going around. Walter and the boys had a pail outside, too, in the shade that they dipped their bandanas in before wrapping them around their heads under their hats or wrapping them around their mouths and noses to keep out the dust. The other thing Rosanna had taught the boys to do was to dip their wrists in the water and hold them there in there long enough for the blood to cool. <sighs> well, obviously the first thing was to pray, so Rosanna set down the pail and went over to Lillian and knelt beside her. She said, Dear Lord, and Lillian said in a sing-song voice, Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray. Lillian couldn't help smiling. She waited for, I mean, Rosanna couldn't help smiling. She waited for Lillian to finish and went on. We see that you are preparing a trial for us. The signs and the symbols are all around us. You give us no rain, and now you have dried up our well. Our crops are thirsty, Lord. We dole out little drops of moisture to them every evening, and they drink them up, but still they look yellow and dry. She was thinking of the beans. We thank you for your past generosity, and we apologize if we have seemed ungrateful. If we have sat down to your bounty without lifting our voices in your praise, we understand that we became proud and flaunted our pride and were punished. Now she was thinking of how Bruno Krauss had come and gone. No customers could afford to pay for such luxuries. He, he had a pastry shop. And she had had to slaughter half her chickens and given them away. And though at first the experience was a bitter one, it showed her that there were people, and not just bums and vagrants, but people in Denby and Usherton who hadn't the wherewithal to buy a chicken. There were people who were starving in the midst of plenty, as it says in the Bible somewhere, we know the trials you send to us are proper tests of our faith, and we hope to pass those tests, dear Lord. <sighs> now she was thinking that Dan Crest was giving her almost nothing for her butter, good as it was, but he said that people didn't care about quality when they could hardly afford to eat. He himself almost went out of business, and it could still happen if the drought, yes, he used the dreaded word, didn't end soon. He had no idea what was next. And neither did Hoover or anyone else. The oat and barley fields were brown, and there weren't many farmers like Walter and his father who had come from who had some from the year before. The corn looked like green sticks thrusting out of rock. It was that dry. She gripped Lillian's hand a little too tightly, and Lillian pulled away. She opened her eyes. Lillian said, Mama, I'm scared. You scared me. And Rosanna coughed and said, You pray, Lillian. The Lord will listen to you, I'm sure. Pray what? Rosanna thought for a second and said, Darling, just close your eyes and say, Dear Father, please have mercy upon your children and keep us and protect us. If there's anything we have done to offend you, we give you our apologies. Say that. 
what what are apologies say saying you're sorry you know like when you make a mess and mama has to clean it up did i make a mess no honey no you didn't i i don't know who did but sometimes you have to say you're sorry and you don't know why do you understand lillian shook her head someday you will we don't know all the things the lord sees sometimes he sees things that we don't and they make him sad and angry and so we have to say we're sorry anyway okay but she still seemed doubtful rosanna began again dear father dear father please take mercy upon us your children and help us please help us rosanna didn't correct her if we have offended you by doing something we are sorry we we are sorry if if we did a bad thing that we didn't know Darling, said Rosanna, it might be that someone else did a bad thing, but it's good if we apologize for it, like Jesus. Like Jesus? Well, Jesus never did a single bad thing, but when he was crucified, he made up for all the bad things that other people had done. That's why he was crucified. Lillian looked at her for a moment, then went back to moving her fingers in the water, and Rosanna wondered if she had gone too far. It was always a shock for a child to find out to truly understand what had happened to Jesus. Rosanna remembered clearly her own reaction of brooding over it for some weeks around Easter and asking the question, nails in his palms, nails? He fell down three times and nobody at all helped him? Where was the good Samaritan? In fact, it was better to have a rather thoughtless child like Frankie who listened then forgot about it who attends still saying round John Virgin without recognizing what, that those words made no sense. <laughs> Finally, Lillian said without looking at her, did you do a bad thing, Mama? Not that I know of. Did Papa? Not that I know of. Frankie? She hesitated, but certainly this was true. <laughs> Not that I know of. <laughs> then, at this point, Joey? I can't imagine Joey or you, Lillian, doing a bad thing or thinking a bad thought. What is a bad thought? Rosanna regretted even beginning this. She said, mm, hating someone. Do you hate anyone? No, and neither does Papa or Frankie or Joey or you, Lillian. I don't know why there isn't any water, but the Lord will provide if we pray to him. Isn't there any water? Well, said Rosanna, let's see. She stood up and lifted Lillian out of the tub, careful to retain as much of that water as she could for plants, maybe even animals. She dried Lillian with a towel and talked, walked her over to the pump. Rosanna picked Lillian up and set her beside the sink, then picked up not the pail with the muck in it, but the pot she used for boiling egg noodles. She set it under the spout of the pump, lifted the handle, and pushed it down, and then did it again. Water, clear water, and cool, spurred it into the pan, and she pumped again. Soon she had about three quarts. The pot held four. She realized that she had panicked. Dimly, in fact, she knew how a well worked. A well was a deep hole into an aquifer. Water seeping through surrounding rock and earth filled the hole, and every well had a capacity a gallon a minute or two or ten or whatever but rosanna had never in her 30 years seen anything come out of a spigot other than water and so she had looked at the muck and panicked lillian was staring at the water and rosanna gave in to temptation and said well darling it's a miracle <laughs> we prayed for the water and the water came Rosanna knew that Walter would disapprove of misrepresenting things in this way, but the words just came out of her mouth. Lillian stared at the water and said, A miracle. Rosanna took her down from the sink and said, Let's go find Dula and Lizzie. I think they've been getting up to mischief. As they left the kitchen hand in hand, Rosanna saw Lillian turn her head to look at the pump. She did feel guilty a bit. But then, what was wrong with believing in miracles? Miracles abounded. There were plenty that you could see and plenty that you couldn't. So, I know we have, uh, there's something I like to do which is just sort of go, psst, 
and see what we come up with. So I'll try that. I, I'll try not to have it be any sex scenes, though. <laughs> um. Hmm. <laughs> I'm going to just read a paragraph. Frank, uh, in uh, toward the end of the toward the middle 30s, 1936, there's a big snowstorm, and Frank has to go to Chicago. He moves into Chicago. He goes to Chicago to live with um, uh, Rosanna's communist sister, Eloise. Um, and who who works for the party, at, her husband does too, in Chicago. And this is the only way he can go to school because there's so much snow. So I'll just read a couple of paragraphs about this. He had fallen in with a gang of boys who ranged all over Lincoln Park in the north side of Chicago, Terry, Mort, Lou, and Bob. Bob was the most accomplished thief. He walked into Woolworths and even into Marshall Fields in one pair of boots and came out in another. For his mother's birthday, he had stolen a five-pound roast, walking out with it under his coat. He had also stolen her birthday present, which was a silk blouse. The other boys, and Frank himself, stuck to packs of cigarettes and bars of chocolate, but Bob would try anything. Terry and Mort were the brawlers. When they happened to run into the gang from St. Michael's, who were good fighters because they were mixed, Terry and Mort could do damage if they had to. Lou, Bob, and Frank did some punching, but only for the fun of it. Terry broke one kid's nose, really broke it, and Mort had another kid down and was kicking him as hard as he could until the kid could hardly walk. Lou was the best talker. He talked a mile a minute, and just like Jimmy Cagney, Lou knew all the stories about the 20s in Chicago and swore up and down that his dad and his uncle had been bootleggers. But Mort said that Lou's dad and uncle were plumbers and always had been, and so what? Lou had perfected a type of swagger and knew how to get into cub games for free, so Frank was looking forward to opening day. The boys were going to skip school, as was everyone else. Wrigley Field was about a half an hour from Eloise's place, less on the L. There was a catcher everybody was wild about named Gabby Hartnett. He was called Gabby because he had a big mouth and was funny. His batting average in the last season was <clears throat> 344, and Lou was sure he would end up in the Hall of Fame. Frank didn't tell him he had never been to a baseball game. Even Julius liked baseball games, and they took Rosa. It was Frank who was good with the girls. The others stood back and gawked at him. He could talk to any girl, and he would talk to any girl. He didn't care whether she was nice or had a bad reputation or was pretty or not. He started by giving a girl the smi a smile, not a dumb smirk or a sideways thing, but a good smile. He made sure she saw it, but he didn't say anything right away. When the girl was used to smiling back, then he would start chatting like they'd been, they'd been talking all along. It was easy. And as he tried to explain this to the others, though to little effect, it didn't matter if some of them walked away. Girls were all the same. You couldn't tell by looking which one you wanted. The other thing was that if you had the girls on your side, then the teachers liked you. Frank didn't know why that was, but maybe that too was the smile. One teacher, Mr. McCarran, he thought might see through him. He was a little impatient and he taught French. But Frank liked French. He was in there with the freshmen since there hadn't been French at North Usherton High School. But he did his work and practiced his pronunciation and raised his hand and asked Mr. McCarran about all the Lou Louis and the Charleses and the Pont and the Gar. He imagined Paris to be a kind of better Chicago. <laughs> he said that his father had spent a lot of time in Paris during the Great War, but of course he hadn't. Yes. Frank had a contribution to make to the gang, and it was certainly on a par with Lou's, Bob's, Terry's, and Mort's. He was the best liar. <laughs> he didn't tell stories, and he didn't put on any performances, but he got them out of trouble two or three times. Frank liked to think of himself as the brains of the operation. <laughs> so I'm happy to answer questions. You know, I taught freshman English, so if you don't, nobody asks a question, I always can call on you. 
I'll, I'll be brave. Okay. Um, uh, I remember you were here many years ago when um, this was smaller. And, mm -hmm. um, you were great. Um, and I, I've read some of your other books. My question is, a lot's happened in the years, decades, since you started writing. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can tell us whether what's happened in sort of the real world at large has affected your your writing, or is this a book you could have written the same way with a lot of the same things 20 years ago, or maybe give us some insight into... Um, well, there's two more volumes of this book. So these, this one ends in 1953. The second volume goes from 53 to 87, and the, and the third volume goes from 87 to 2019. So yes, I've included a lot of stuff that's happened in volume two and three. Would I have written the same book? No. I came up with this idea about five years ago. First thing I thought of was the title of the trilogy, which is The Last Hundred Years. And, um, and then I thought, well, where am I going to set the family? And then I thought, I, I conceived of um, Walter and Rosanna and how old they were, which is similar to the age of my grandparents when they were married. And then I gave the children sort of the personalities that they emerged into the world with, and I set them on their way. And their job is to make their way, just like any other kids. You, you know, um, some of you may have read my book, 13 Ways of Looking at the Novel, and there's a chapter in there um, called The Circle of the Novel. And it's like a clock, an old-fashioned clock, and it has all the components of the novel uh, on the clock. And one of the components is history and one of the components is gossip. <laughs> and I realize that a lot of this book, it, this book has a few other components, but the main components are history and gossip. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, since several of your books have an agricultural motif, I'd be interested in knowing do you now or have you ever lived on a farm? No, but I lived in Ames. <laughs> What's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I first moved to Iowa City, I was uh, just, uh, I was 22. And we didn't actually live in Iowa City. We lived out in Wellman on an in a farmhouse where the farmer next door was farming the fields. And they hadn't torn the house down yet. And, um, I read some books there by uh, up while I was first living there, for books about ecology and environment, environmentalism. And I remember looking at the well and thinking, oh, I wonder what's in there, in the water system, in the water supply. And that was probably what first sent me down that path. Um, so I was, because I lived in Iowa, I was quite interested in farming. Um, I was quite interested in the ecology of farming, the transformation of farming in our lifetime. And um, so probably if I had gone to the University of Virginia, I would have set down, headed down another path. But so there was the Des Moines California. Register, you know? Pardon me? <laughs> now you live in California. I do, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. You mentioned that you teach. I wonder if I did teach. You did teach. Okay. I have taught. Well, I will you ta taught. teach. <laughs> <laughs> when you taught, I wonder if what you're writing at the time affects what or how you're teaching, or whether the teaching in some way affects what you're writing. Is there any interaction there at all? Yes, there's some interaction. I remember there was a story I was writing um, uh, when I was first teaching in Ames, and I had a graduate class, and I. I was talking about the story, not to graduate students, but to undergraduate students. For some reason, I don't even know why. And in talking about it, and in talking about sort of rules of story writing or tips for story writing, I came up with how to move on in this story. So um, yeah, I mean, this book, 13 Ways, uh, talks about the interplay between right. reading and writing. So if you're, if you're you and students are reading, and you're talking to them about their reading, then inevitably it's, you're going to be talking to yourself about your, what the things that you're reading to. 
Um, two, two questions that are sort of related. Um, do you write with the idea of how it will sound when you're reading it out loud? And when you're reading it out loud like this, do you ever look even in a published work and say, gee, I should have used a different word Absolutely, or second guess? Absolutely, I did that tonight. <laughs> Um, I, I could sort of tell. <laughs> <laughs> I only did it once, though. Um, I read, my, my husband is, uh, was the kind of kid who wore a dunce cap when he was in grammar school because he, ha he was dyslexic and had auditory processing disorder, and they really didn't realize how smart he was. And so in the, uh, every morning I read to him what I wrote the day before. And um, he points out, um, sometimes he points out factual errors, sometimes he dozes off, sometimes he says, I don't understand what you're getting at. So he's in some sense the first, first reader and the first, I wouldn't call it a critic, but the first helper. And so that's very good for me. And then I correct the punctuation and whatever it is and go on. But uh, normally I would say, other than that, you got to go from the beginning to the end of your novel and um, then rewrite it after that. Yeah. Hi. I'm curious about the process of writing historical fiction. When you're writing, how do you keep from living at the pace that we live at now? It seems like it would be hard to slow down. The internet is so fast and you can get things so quickly. How do you arrive at a place where, do you just avoid the internet and, and, and trappings of modern life? Or how, how do you get to the place where you can write in a, at a pace that seems appropriate for the 1930s, for example? Um, well, I've written a handful of historical novels. So one was The Greenlanders, which is set in the uh, 15, 14th to 15th century. One was The Altered Travels and Adventures of Liddy Newton, which is set in the 19th century. One is Private Life, which goes from about 1878 to about 1952, and then this. So each one has presented a different mm -hmm. problem. Um, the Greenlanders came before the internet, so I just had a stack of books. That was the extant material. I went to Greenland, I went to Denmark, looked at the finds that had been taken out of the permafrost in the 1930s, read the Icelandic sagas and then scratched my head until I came up with what I thought was going to work. Um, I think each one is different. You, uh, what I try to do to some extent, there's two choices you can make as a historical novelist. You can <coughs> attempt to mimic the language of the time mm -hmm. or you can attempt to use a kind of very, a very clear, plain language um, and then just have the people acting and talking in your new clear, plain language, but, um, it's, but it's not attempting to mimic the language of the time. Each one has its problems. Um, but I've always chosen to attempt to mimic the language of the time. I think that's to get my mind out of the present time and to I back into that time. So when I was reading, when I was writing The Greenlanders, it really did feel like I was sitting down at the typewriter or the computer and putting on this bearskin rug <laughs> and going into this world. Um, other writers do it differently, mm -hmm. you know, so um, it really depends on which one you feel more at home with, I think, so. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, when I read Thousand Acres a couple of years ago, uh, also about Iowa farm life, wonderful novel. Uh, Thank you. I recognized right away that you were using King Lear as a mm -hmm. background, and, and I'm inevitably going to look at read this novel and thinking, is she doing some something like that this time around? And maybe no. I can just ask the question this time. No. <laughs> All I wanted to do was fulfill this title, The Last Hundred Years. That's all I wanted to do. I started with King with a thousand acres. I started with the play. I read it five times. When at one point in the writing of the novel, I diverged from the play. I realized I was getting into deep shit, and I <laughs> went back and to where I departed unintentionally. I have to say, 
and tried to get back to the, to the play. Um, but in this case, it was much more free form. I just knew where I was headed, but I didn't know how I was going to get there. I mean, there were certain things I assumed. I assumed Frank would go off to the war because he was born in 1920. Um, I assumed that farming would change. Uh, and I assumed that somebody would stay on the farm. Um, but characters showed up, like at the end of this book, Arthur shows up. And um, Arthur is Lillian's uh, future husband. Well, they marry, and they moved to Washington, D.C., actually. <laughs> um, but I didn't know Arthur was going to show up. But he showed up. <laughs> and I fell in love with Arthur. And so I kept him alive for a really long time. <laughs> um, so this was much more free form in terms of where the story was to go. It had boundaries, but it didn't, but it didn't have a structure like King Lear. Hi, I'm a colleague of your daughter's, and I already I asked. I can tell by your t-shirt. <laughs> and I already asked her this question, and Either she refused to answer or she didn't know, so I'll okay. try you. <laughs> so it's the first of a trilogy? Yes. So are you? Are they done, or are you just so confident no, that done. you can do it? Ah, okay. <laughs> um, I still have to fiddle with the last five years. So well, I'll ask this question since you brought it up. Um, everybody just shout out, nightmare president. 2016 election, who's your worst nightmare? <laughs> Come on, be brave. Uh, <laughs> Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, somebody else. <laughs> Ra Ted Cruz, okay, I won't tell you what Mary said. <laughs> Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, okay. Anybody, Paul Ryan, okay, oh, Paul. <laughs> I think you struck a chord there. <laughs> yeah. The, um, okay. So, all right. I'll keep that in mind. Okay. <laughs> you guys obviously are the ones in the know. I asked that question in Wichita, and they, nobody had anything to say on that song. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they were they. Those persons in Wichita that are our nightmare weren't present at my reading. <laughs> Everybody at the reading did. Nobody professed to be a Republican at the reading, and it was a pretty large group too. Joe Biden. He's your nightmare. Yeah. Okay. I'll remember that too. Joe Biden. Um, my question is about um. I don't know literary or historical influences. Uh, I assume that you read the um, series Little House on the Prairie when you were young, and I'm wondering whether the, that experience sort of became part of your DNA and has actually um, influenced your uh -huh. setting and um, your you know, choice of uh, venues for your stories. I would say, yes, it, they were read to me. We didn't read them, but Mrs. Winkelmeyer read them to us. <laughs> and um, I wouldn't, I don't quite know how I was influenced by The Little House on the Prairie, but when I was um, doing the research for Private Life, which was my last novel, I needed to find information about small town life in Missouri and who should I come across? Laura Angus Wilder. But Laura, no, Rose Wilder Lane, who oh, wrote okay. a little book about. Um, that. And so I was so entranced by Rose Wilder Lane that I put her in the book. So she is in Private Life as Dora. Oh, okay. And um, so that's my main response to influences of Laura Ingles, Ingles Wilder. Okay, thanks. If we, but, you know, let's talk about influences for a minute. I think for a lot of writers, um, the books, the first books, first adult books you read, um, say when you're 13 or 14 are the real influential ones. And for me, those were David Copperfield, which we read in ninth grade, um, Giants in the Earth, 
which we read in ninth grade. Raise your hand if you read Giants in the Earth. <gasps> There's a few of you. Um, and a book called The Web of Life, which we read in ninth grade biology about ecology, about the ecosystem. That is a natural novelist book because it's about how things are connected in an ecosystem. Um, why they would give us um, Giants in the Earth to read as ninth graders, I have no idea. The, the woman um, goes mad and hides in a trunk <laughs> and her husband, the hero, freezes to death on the lee side of a hay um, mound um, in, the, in, a, in a blizzard, you know, and so we're reading. <laughs> but, you know, that's what we read in those days. It's a great book, so I recommend it. No one else. Well, thank you all for coming. It was a great, lots of fun. I really liked it.